Congrats, you've booked your first wedding. Now you have to photograph it and produce it. I'm gonna give you all the things, legalities, contracts, including how to make sure you don't look like a jerk, like it's your first wedding in front of all the other vendors. I'm Vanessa Joy, I'm a Canon Explorer of Light and I've been a wedding photographer for the past 20 years. I have a ton of wedding photography information here on this channel, so make sure you hit like and subscribe. All right, let's get down into it. I've got about 10 things for you. First, we're gonna talk about contracts because if you did not have your client, friend or family, I don't care, especially friend or family, if you did not have them sign a contract, you absolutely need to. It is a must. You need to write down at bare minimum expectations that are set what they're paying or not paying, what you are delivering to them, how long you're gonna be there, what happens if, God forbid, a monsoon comes through when you can't show up or you get sick, what happens if your camera equipment breaks, make sure a model release is in there so you can use these photos for your advertising later, lots of things there. If you go on my website, yes, you can download my contract. No, I'm not a lawyer, but you can see what I use. You could also go somewhere like the Law Tog. Rachel, she has contracts that you can download get a contract that is first and foremost, do not continue watching this video until you have gotten a contract, save it for later, hit pause, whatever, come back. Number two, the gear. Here's the gear that you absolutely need to have on a wedding day. Well, I've, I've got a video for that too. Of course, you can click and watch this video all about my wedding photography gear and what I think you need, especially minimally. But if I'm going to break it down for you, you need two cameras. Do not go to the most special day of this person's life and not have backup with you. You need two cameras. One is your main one, one is your backup. Some people like to have those two cameras and keep one wide angle lens on and one telephoto lens. So one wide and then one zoomed in so they can easily switch back and forth. You can get double holsters for that, whether it's a spider holster. I love spider holsters. I have a double holster, it's awesome. Or you can get uh, slings, just depending on what you wanna do. I like shooting with one camera, but if you're photographing by yourself and you don't have another second photographer or an assistant with you, you might want the double camera thing on you with one wide lens and one long lens. You want to make sure not only do you have memory cards that are large enough to hold all the photos that you are going to take on a wedding day because you will probably take a lot and you should be backing it up twice having a camera with two card slots. So that means that you need to double up on your memory cards. For a wedding day, I like to have a minimum of a 128 gigabyte memory card and I use Lexar professional cards. Now that's minimum. I do prefer having a 512 gigabyte, which just makes it so that I don't have to change a memory card at all throughout the entire wedding day. Now don't panic because I'm doubling that up. I'm always using two card slots. So even if something were to go wrong with one card, I already have it automatically backed up. Not that I've ever had anything go wrong with my Lexar cards, but it's just safety and smart if your camera can do it. I also have to tell you to make sure you're getting the newest cards that are going to help your camera operate more smoothly. A lot of us photographers will spend thousands of dollars on cameras, but then buy memory cards that are cheap and can't write as fast as our cameras work. You want to make sure that you get the best possible memory card for your camera's technology. And then on the flip side, when you're backing up all of the photos, it's just going to back those photos up. And then after the wedding, when you're copying all those photos onto your hard drive, it's going to read faster so it doesn't take as long. Spend a couple of extra bucks on quality memory cards like these Lexar ones here, and you will absolutely be happy you did. All right, back to the video. We have to talk about setting expectations with the client aside from a contract because there's what's in the contract and then there's what is expected of you the day of it. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure when it comes to weddings especially. So we wanna make sure that we're getting things in place like a really good uh, shot list. Uh, speaking of shot list, you wanna make sure that you don't just say, hey, what photos do you want me to take? Because then they're gonna give you a list that they found online and it's gonna be ridiculous. Don't worry, I'll tell you about some of the bigger moments later. But honestly, since it's your first one, it wouldn't hurt you to look for that list just so you can see kind of the important things, things that most couples expect from a wedding. But what I really want to talk to you about is the family photo list because I have a free guide for you. You can download it and it's going to help you create family photo lists, not just make sure everybody's accounted for, but to put them in the specific order. This is key. Put that family list in the very specific order that you need so that it runs smoothly. The same exact set of, let's say, 15 family photos can take a half an hour or it can take five minutes based on how you've set it up. And I show you how to do that in exactly the correct order in this free download. So grab it because time, my friend, is not usually on your side. And that's where we get to next is 
timelines. Timelines are absolutely essential. If they're working with a wedding planner, wonderful. Work with that wedding planner on the timeline. If not, the photographer tends to become the timeline person. So here's what I recommend. You can actually just click on the other link below that goes to a blog post that I have for you that has two different types of timelines. One if there is a first look and one if there is not a first look. So you've got really two different types of wedding scenarios. If you're doing a South Asian wedding, Indian wedding, those are a little bit different. They have breaks in there, but still the time that I've allotted for like getting ready, pictures of the couple pictures of the family pictures of the wedding party like all of those things are in there and you're going to want that breakdown so i gave it to you in black and white in this blog post so you can click the link in the description below now like i mentioned time is not on your side so you might want a little thing in your pocket called speed posing you can head to speedposing.com to learn all about it but in a nutshell it's going to go over those family list orders really quickly and it's going to tell you how to get the most out of the time that you have or don't have uh, with your couple and with the wedding party and get a lot of variety of photos for later when you're going to build an album. We'll get to that. So you've got your gear. Now you want to make sure you set your gear correctly. So setting your gear up for weddings, I suggest shooting raw. I suggest shooting to two memory cards. If your camera has it, I recommend that your camera has it. I just think weddings are too precious and too unique. You, there are no redos on it. You should have double backup as you're taking the photos, your focus settings. I highly recommend you take a look at this video. So I show you exactly how I set up my focus settings, but in general, I like a tracking focus. So AI servo and Canon cameras. I like eye detection on there. And then for weddings specifically, I turn on something that's called highlight alert and I enable that. What that does is when I play back my photo and I look at it on the back of my camera, it will blink black in spots where I have blown out the whites. There's no detail in the whites, i.e a wedding dress. When I blow that out and there's no detail, it's super overexposed. I'm never going to bring it back. It's going to warn me. And I think that is extremely important. You can also turn on another very wedding to me, wedding specific camera feature in Canon cameras, and it's called highlight priority. So the camera is going to prioritize capturing details in the highlights at the expense of the details in the shadows. But to me for weddings, the highlights, white wedding dress anyway, is more important to capture those details and try to preserve those. So I like to enable it. It does make your lowest ISO go down to only 200, but I think that's fine for it's a good trade off for me. That brings me to my next point. You definitely want to have a wide and a long lens and a little bit in between, depending on your budget and the gear that you already have, I would say you need to at least have around a 24 to 28 for a wide. Some people live with just 35. I tend to think you might be in tighter spaces than that, or you'll have potentially a wider shot that you want than a 35 millimeter. If you can get a 16 millimeter, the RF 16 millimeter 2.8 lens that Canon has is a uh, fairly affordable and is a great one to just throw in. Maybe if you have a 24 to 105 or a 24 to 70 to go with that for that mid range. And then on the longest side, everything between is really your preference. Again, watch those videos if you want to see mine, but on the long end, I would say you need to at least have like a 135 focal length. A lot of photographers like uh, more of a 70 to 200 zoom lens on that end, but that's a personal preference. But there will be situations where you cannot get close without being obtrusive. And that goes into the next point on how to act on the wedding day. You cannot be obtrusive. Do not stand five feet in front of the bride and groom and blocking all the guests view. Be extremely conscious of the guests point of view. And if you are in it, you cannot be super tight up close to the person giving a speech. You cannot be right up their face or maybe following them down the aisle. Let me tell you that happened to me once I had a videographer, the bride is walking down the aisle and he is in front of her literally blocking the groom's view of his woman walking down the aisle with uh, it was a videographer. So with the, the camera, do not do that. Do not be that person put on that long lens. You can stand at the front of the aisle. The groom is here. You are here, maybe reversed. If it's a Jewish ceremony, you can stand up there. It's okay, but do it with a long lens. Do not walk down the aisle with her. You are not the bride's father. You do not walk down the aisle with her or anybody else. If you can shoot with a long lens, shoot with a long lens 
in those situations. You wanna get funky and wide later where you're not blocking anybody, have fun on the dance floor, like go for it. Do not be intrusive at a wedding. That is like rule number one. It's the first way to ruin your reputation with the other wedding vendors, with the bride and groom, and with every single one of those guests that does not get to see a single picture that you took probably, but will already have an opinion of you based on your behavior. And that moves on to how you dress. I always suggest dressing in all black or dressing to how the guests are dressed. You are supposed to be blending in. White sneakers and jeans, my friends, only blend in if you've got like a hoedown bar wedding, maybe at a fire hall. Otherwise, you should be dressed professionally and in dark colors. Do your hair, do your makeup, look professional because people can only judge you at that point by how you look and how you act. They can't judge you by the beautiful art that you are creating. They just can't. Make sure you're always smiling. That's just huge. Just smile through the stress, smile and nod, make it happen, make things happen. Uh, and here's big once. So that was more like ceremony ish stuff. Once you get to the hall and the venue, make sure that you do not eat cocktail hour in front of everybody. You absolutely do not drink alcohol. I don't care if the bride and groom offer or said you could just just don't do it because while the bride and groom and the, might be okay with you eating cocktail hour in front of everybody, the guests are going to be like, eh, or they're going to be asking you to take photos while you're trying to take a second and eat. If you're allowed to take cocktail hour food, some halls you are, some halls you are not. Take that cocktail hour food and go like hide with it. Like go in the reception hall with it inconspicuously and eat what you're allowed to eat. Take your breaks. I'm all for the breaks. I'm all for the food but don't do it like sitting down in the middle of the ballroom. And definitely don't drink alcohol because what's happening is that venue is seeing you and they are not happy. They won't be recommending you. They might even tell other people not to work with you because of the unprofessional behavior. So all of those things are really big when it comes to how you socially behave at a wedding day. Permits, permits is a big one. So if you are going anywhere to take photos that the bride and groom did not pay for like the venue they paid for if you're going to a park if you're doing a pop-up wedding you want to make sure that permits have been obtained i do make sure that my clients are the ones that are obtaining those permits so it's not on me but you have to have permits to shoot in places don't get caught super embarrassed and unprepared getting kicked out of a place that you told your clients that would be great for pictures it won't work out well it's not nice so just be prepared depending if you have a second photographer this is where we're gonna start planning for after the wedding. So many photographers and even couples only think about before and during the wedding, but photography continues on after the wedding. So plan on how you're going to get files from your second photographer. If you have one, have a photographer coming to help you. Are you giving them a memory card to shoot on so that you take that memory card and you are responsible for it at the end of the night? Are you bringing a hard drive to download them? Do they get to keep those images? Do they get to post those images? Who do they get to tag in those images? Because that's your client. So some of those things are debatable, but just make sure you have a really efficient communication of that beforehand with your other photographer and a really great way for you to grab um, the images from that photographer. So there's no delay in you coming home and backing up all the photos. You should be backing up all of your photos in three different places. One is a local hard drive, computer, whatever. Second is a backup of that and preferably off site somewhere. If your house has a fire, it's, you want it somewhere else. If not, then some kind of RAID configuration where you have redundant drives is ideal. And then the third place is somewhere on the cloud. Maybe use Dropbox or Backblaze. Get it off site and it off planet, <laughs> if you will, but get it somewhere in the cloud. So it's super backed up both your files as well as the second photographer's files. And you want to do that really quickly just for safety reasons, but also so you can get editing. Editing ideally for weddings on average, people deliver photos within 12 weeks. You get longer than that. You're going to start getting antsy clients. I hope you've set expectations for that ahead of time. Those are some of the things you should talk about with the wedding client beforehand. How long is it going to be until maybe I see some sneak peek pictures the next week, the next day, the day of the wedding, I have a video on how to do those same day edits as well as printing them the day of it's pretty awesome. And then you want to make sure that you tell them what to expect for the full gallery. Speaking of galleries, how are you going to deliver that gallery? Are you just going to mail them a USB drive? Maybe that's your agreement. Fine. Maybe you want to host it online, which is what I recommend so that their friends and family can go view it, download, which you can charge for downloads uh, and prints. They can get photos and print them. Maybe that's how your clients are going to get them. Maybe they get their web resolution downloads, but they have to pay for the high ones. I don't know. You got to work that part out. We'll talk about pricing in a second, but 
online gallery is preferred, at least for me. I use Enview. You can check them out. Oh, and for editing your images. So know what you promised, you know, and then you have to edit your images. Now, AI is sweeping the nation, especially when it comes to editing wedding photos. So I like Imagine AI. Not only can you build, since this is your first wedding, you can build a profile, basically your editing preferences around a Lightroom preset that you'd like. And some, you know, you tell them if you like things warmer, cooler, lighter, darker, and how you like it tinted. And then you can also just buy other profiles. So you can actually edit the way I edit by just buying my profile there. So it supports me, yes it does. Um, but either way, no matter what you do, those types of AI programs are really, really sweeping the nation. You can absolutely do it manually. If you're really good in Lightroom, go for it. Imagine AI. Is it's gonna make your life a lot easier and you're definitely gonna hit that deadline or a lot easier in that case. If you've already booked your first wedding, you may or may not have a website, but in case you don't, that is absolutely something you're going to want to do, especially after you have photographed this first wedding and you have all these beautiful images to show what you can do for future clients. I'm a big fan of Squarespace and I have used them for so many years for my own website, for both my wedding website, as well as headshots and other ones in the past. They just have the easiest templates to work with, very quick drag and drop technology, and of course, tons of options, customizations, and lots of extensions and widgets that you can use for things like e-commerce, setting up appointments, and so much more. Definitely consider creating a website either before or after you photograph this first wedding. It's something that's going to show off beautifully what you can do as a wedding photographer. It's really just a staple, a home place where your storefront can be. You can get a discount on Squarespace using my link below. And then and my advice is to continually update your website at least once a year, if not every six months with all of the new work that you have. It's pretty easy to just add photos into galleries in Squarespace, so you'll have no problem doing that. Although it is very difficult to choose what photos go on the website, that's for a completely different video. Okay, so after the wedding, you've edited the photos, you deliver the online gallery. Now I need you to do something really brave and I need you to do this right off the bat. You need to be a full service photographer. You need to do it. It is a crime for you to not enable your clients, not give them the opportunity to cherish their photos in the best possible way. And that's through tangible products. Do not let your precious first wedding photos that you've ever taken die a digital death. Tell your clients, hey, we can print it. At least offer it to them. Offer to make them an album. Offer to make them wall art. Give them the opportunity and decision to say no. Don't say no for them. Tell them you can do this. And yes, you'll have to learn how to do it, but learn how to do it now. Because in the future, and what you've probably noticed by all these things that you have to do and all this time that you have to spend, it's not a cheap thing to do to produce a wedding as a wedding photographer. So you want to have opportunities for your clients to invest more in their photography with printed products. And it's better because as a photographer, your job does not stop when you capture the story. Your job continues in you telling the story and your clients don't know that it's your job as a professional to make that happen. Learn how to design albums. I use Fundy Designer. It's awesome. It's easy. It will not take you much time and then print them through a professional quality lab like H and H color lab. They make gorgeous albums. It takes a minute, no matter where you go to learn how to do these things, but learn how to do it now. Learn how to do it right away on your very first wedding. You will thank me because you will not only have happier clients, you will have printed beautiful products that you are so proud of and your, and your couples are so proud of and they're passing them down through generations and they have that responsibility to pass down that heritage. Wedding photography is sacred in so many ways and it creates a legacy and printing that legacy is much, much better of a way to enjoy it for your clients. So start it now. Plus it's gonna raise your bottom line because you definitely make more money selling printed products than you ever do taking a picture. I hope you enjoy your first wedding. Let me know if you have any stories. I always have horror stories. Actually, I've got a great YouTube video here about wedding horror stories you can take a look at. Let me know how your first wedding went. I hope it was incredible. I hope you fell in love with it and you want to do more and more. Good luck.